Welcome to the Teaching Bites Podcast. Here are your hosts, Fred and Sharon Jaravada. And we have on this show, we have my colleague, Krista Anchasti. She works with me in the Uncle for a Spark studio here at the School to Sick Your Heart. And we welcome you, Krista. So, Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, Krista, let's jump th- into this. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you, where you came from and what your experience is with education. Okay, well, I come from a family of educators, teachers, um, and mm-hmm. my brother's a teacher, my dad is a teacher, uh, and so right out of college, I got a job at a school, um, kind of a progressive alternative school in Southern California, and I've been in schools ever since. So I've been teaching and in and around schools for the last 20, 20 years. That's a long time. That's well, it's long. not that long, okay? <laughs> but yes, it's so, a while. So you've always been into education? So I've always been into education. Okay. Um, what I had, grades or what, what parts? Well, I went to graduate school in and finished in 1998, and since then I've been at Schools of the Sacred Heart. I have never actually had a classroom or focused on a particular grade. I've always been sort of a support person working with a variety of age groups in a variety of contexts. So originally I came here as the enrichment coordinator uh, for the schools, and now for the last Three years, four years, I've been working down here in the Unkifer Lab with you and uh, working to spread innovation. Innovation. Okay. So can you quickly go um, talk about the innovation part of the school, what we're doing here? So people can believe me that I actually work in a school. You do work in a school. <laughs> you, de- you definitely work in a school. And uh, our job is to work with teachers and with students to increase the use of innovative teaching practices throughout the curriculum and throughout the grade levels. And we meet with teachers to assist them, to give them support, to give them moral support, to give them technology that will help them to implement their most innovative ideas. Um, Sometimes those experiments are more or less successful, but we, we try. (laughs) <laughs> we, we do try. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> okay. So we'll get into that a little bit more about the, uh, some of the challenge of, the, of that <clears throat> later. But um, you said you're, you, you're coming from a family of educators. Now, is that why you were, you were um, drawn into education, that you want to jump into education? Possibly. Possibly. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But, yeah, I think I, think I was... Um, I was pretty clear about my career track from the beginning. So I went to college and majored in psychology with an end game. I was going to become a teacher in public schools. I wanted to teach fourth grade. I thought that would be great. California history, gold rush. Right, the missions. The missions. Um, But as I got deeper into the education side of that psychology degree, I, I started to see a bigger picture and be less intrigued by what was happening within the classroom and more interested in the dynamics of schools, schools as workplaces, schools as social places, schools as societies in and of themselves. Right. Very, very, that's very deep. <laughs> well. It's very deep. <laughs> Well, okay. So, since you started in the school, what was the time that we call the aha moment, like, that validated, like, okay, teaching is for me, and it's just not something that's been in my family, in my family, and something where I'm, I'm really teaching, and like, you know what, this is great. What was that aha moment? I think for me, I, I had kind of a surprising aha moment, which was um, we teach in a school that is a Catholic school. It's an independent school with a Catholic tradition founded by nuns in the religious of the Sacred Heart. And I am not Catholic. I have never been religious. And I originally applied to this job um, because the the idea of, of, of working with gifted 
kids really appealed to me, and I, I wanted to see what it was about. But when I came to the schools, I was surprised at how deeply the school's philosophy resonated with me and resonated with the education that I had just received. I came here right after I finished um, graduate school at Stanford, where I studied educational philosophy primarily. And so I, my head was just full of John Dewey and Aristotle and right. all of those just high-minded people. But to come to a school like this and see so much of what we were talking about embodied, it was, it was powerful for me. And even though I didn't have that religion um, connection to the school, I, I felt really strongly about being here that that was the right thing to do. All right, so we kicked out the kids. We kicked out the teachers out of here. Now we're back to our show. Um, so going back to that question, Krista, about um, a favorite quote, a favorite phrase, something that resonates with you in your teaching, in your personal life, your professional life, something that is profound. Do you have anything to share? Well, one of the things that um, has stuck with me, I didn't even realize... Uh. How it, would re how it would stick with me at the time. But um, when I was at Stanford, I took a class on the ethic of care with Nell Noddings, who is an amazing educational philosopher. Um, and like everybody there, she's building on the tradition of John Dewey and the progressive educators. And one of the things that she wrote in her book was that everything we do as teachers has moral overtones. And I try to keep that in mind, that what we do is so much more about the students and the person we are to them and with them, and that so much of teaching is relational. It's not about the subject matter as much as it is about the relationship and the way we treat each other in front of students and the way we treat our students. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's uh, when in teaching, I remember when I was going to uh, grad school in the, the teacher's uh, credential program at USF, I, mean, I don't remember talking about like relationships, you know, and I think that gets glossed over. And th that can be really, I mean, it's so emotional. It can be so powerful, right? I mean, how do you get through that? I mean, how do you, you know, do that every day, making sure that you check yourself that it's about the students and because you know teachers we get through we we go through a lot you know we get a lot of pressures from everywhere else and how do you make you know refocus yourself well it's funny one of the i forget which one now but one of the yeah. classical philosophers talked about that morality was just the practice of being a moral person right that you become moral when you act that way every day and that that's the practice of that is how you become that thing. And so I think the more you engage with your students and your school and your peers and your colleagues in a thoughtful way, the more you become habituated to it and you it just becomes second nature. Um, I also think that I have been fortunate to be in a position in schools where I'm not responsible for implementing curriculum X, Y, and Z. Um, you and I right now are part of a team that supports innovative teaching and learning in our students. And it gives us a lot of freedom to follow up on the passions that our students have, mm -hmm. to engage with them about their ideas in a really pure way. Um, we don't have to redirect them to necessarily complete certain curricular mileposts. Rather, we are able to engage on the level of ideas and on the and engage on the level of relationship and uh, that's I think to me that's the most powerful thing about our our place in the school right now right yeah I agree with you 100 percent now let's move on to a challenging moment a time where can you share with us another sto a story about a time when things got really challenging in, in the schools. It doesn't have to be in this school. Now remember, you don't use names. Right? We don't use names on this podcast. <laughs> um, but what are, or what was a time 
share a time with us. It was challenging, either with students or with, with, with colleagues, and how you overcame that. Well, I think one of the challenging things right now um, is the role we play in terms of faculty and faculty support. And I think that a lot of teachers feel challenged in a very confrontational way by the idea of innovation. Innovation means change. Change means that what you're doing isn't right or isn't good enough. Right. And since you and I are the faces of that educational innovative, um, that educational innovation uh, mandate, I feel like we become... The other. <laughs> the other or the judges or the evaluators, which we're not. Right. The idea and our approach is hopefully that as peers, as colleagues, we can push each other and challenge each other to reach our goals and to reframe what we're doing in light of new educational research or in light of new technologies or tools and that we constantly evolve our program. But... I'm not sure that's the way it's always received, and that's hard for me. So why do you think there's a pushback on that? Why? I mean, why the innovation, people don't like to see innovation, even though we see that in all the news and all the politicians and all these other teachers out there pushing innovation. What do you think? I mean, the whole, the whole atmosphere of what's happening out there in the real world, in schools, about innovation. and Do you feel there's a pushback? I do feel like there's a pushback. Um, I am personally not a super proponent necessarily of technology. Mm -hmm. What I am a super proponent of is the way that new tools, as they come out, are able to make us better at what we've been trying to do as educators for as long as schools have been around. Right. Um, you know, to me, a perfect example is the idea of the Google Cardboard, which is this very simple, um, it's, it's almost like a toy, a piece of cardboard that allows you to use your iPhone or iPad as a 3D virtual viewer, reality, right. virtual reality viewer. Um, Where you insert the, uh, the device inside these goggle-looking uh, cardboard you put the phone in, and then your lens is in there, so it makes it look like it's in 3D. So you interact with this environment. Our students, when I stick my phone in and allow them to play, all they want to do is chase dinosaurs around, which is right. funny. But the power of that tool is that you can also go inside the experience of being a Syrian refugee. You can place yourself inside right. these environments where that have been captured on film you're there right. and and if there's anything that's going to promote empathy in ourselves and our students it's that and that's a case where it's not about the technology it's about the power of what the technology does to teach something that we're trying to teach all the time it's bringing us it's bringing the the student closer this teacher closer exactly to what's happening or what you want to to teach right like I guess like it's the um, empathy part. Exactly, right? exactly. And so much, there's so much talk right now about design thinking and educational design and human-centered design, and right. which is great. But that first step of empathy, that first step of thinking about the person is so key to what we do as teachers. Mm -hmm. And... As far as I'm concerned, it's one of the most difficult things to teach because you really have to embody it. You can't lecture about it. You can't fabricate scenarios where people feel empathy. It's a feeling that you have to instill. Right. It's very dynamic. It's very. It's not static. It's nothing you can just pull out. It, you kind of have to just recognize what's happening now. Right. Exactly. It, it's very dynamic. Okay. So now. I remember you were talking about how being a teacher that it's always about the moral the moral of being a teacher the morals of being a teacher has to be student centered is that or child centered 
Yes. Now you have children in your life. How does that affect you in their in 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 their education now? When you see their teachers or their what they're doing in school or it is interesting to see it from the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very close to my niece and my two nephews, and uh, one of my nephews is graduating from high school this year. And so um, seeing him through the system, kindergarten all the way, all those years, it's been, um, it's been a valuable experience to see it from the other side, actually. I mean, talk about developing empathy, you right. know, to hear from a parent perspective and to kind of view it from a student's perspective, too. Mm-hmm. Um, Fortunately, my niece is the youngest. She's still at the age where she thinks that being a teacher is equivalent to just being the holder of all wisdom. <laughs> so she uh, she won't let anyone help her with her homework except me because I'm the teacher. The teacher. So I must know all the answers. <laughs> um, so cool, yeah. Yeah, well, it's cool until she realizes that. You don't know the answers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But like, what are you for, talking about? Yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> so... Um, but it's been a valuable it's been it's been valuable to look at it from both sides. I think also it's been the fact that I am a teacher. Mm-hmm. The fact that I am a teacher has allowed me to um, offer their parents some other perspectives. When they're upset about something happening at school, I can chime in and give the school perspective. Right. Okay. What do you need over there? How about a book? How about a book, movie, or even song? Something, what, what inspires you? What, um, what book or what movie or what song inspires you to your teaching or in your teaching? Or, you know what I mean? I do. I do. I'm trying to think if there's something I go back to every time when I'm feeling sort of low right. about my like job. you want to quit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can I afford to quit this job? <laughs> Which doesn't happen very often, but I think it happens to everybody. Um, and to be honest, I find most of my inspiration in ideas. Um, as you know, like you, I'm an avid podcast listener. And one of the things I love is to hear about something new, specifically in science or a project that's happening uh, somewhere in the country. Right. And bringing that to the students. Name, name one. Name a couple of podcasts that you listen to. Okay. Besides Teaching Bites? <laughs> yes. Besides Teaching Bites. You hear that, people? <laughs> um, one of my very favorites is called The Memory Palace. It is a history podcast. It gives these tiny little vignettes, little stories from history. Um, it's only it's between like 8 and 15 minutes long. Right. Some of them as short as three minutes. Wow. But they're beautiful stories told very eloquently. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Radio Lab is a huge one. Radio Lab, yeah. Um, the other one that's inspired my teaching a lot has been um, Studio 360. What is that? Which is um, an arts and design podcast out of WNYC. It is a lot of interviews with people who are in movies or musicians. But they also do a lot of discussion of design projects. So I heard a story once on there about the 10,000-year clock. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's a clock that's... They're building this enormous clock in Nevada somewhere. I don't have all the details Mm -hmm. at my fingertips. But the clock, instead of running on a 12-hour cycle or a 24-hour cycle, is supposed to run on a 10,000-year cycle. 10,000. Oh, wow. Okay. And they're going to develop a different chime. Huh. For every day, huh. for ten thousand years. Wow, that's that's incredible. I gotta okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll <laughs> find I'll find a link for that. and I'll put it in the show notes. Huh. What's the name of it again? Studio Three Hundred and Sixty. Studio Three Hundred and Sixty. And what's the other one you were talking about? The um, Radio Lab. Radio Lab. And the his, the Memory Palace. The Memory Palace. Yeah, okay, very cool. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the show notes. All right. So since you are you are an educational innovation coordinator tech teacher, and so on. What's your favorite tech or web resource tool? Well, right now I've already mentioned it. I'm really into experimenting with the Google Cardboard, what Mm -hmm. that means, what is possible to do with it. It's 
And it's quite affordable, too. It's $4. You can get a whole class set really easily. And um, a lot of the apps are free. And I think that it has the potential to really do some cool things. I'm not not sure um, how to create content for it, but I think it's possible. And to have some student-created content would be amazing. That would be. Is there? Now I know it's all visual. Is there sound? I don't remember. Yeah. There's sound, right? Yeah. So you can invent really even wear headphones. Exactly, a mix around sound. Huh. Okay. Um, we have a couple of GoPros in the lab. Mm-hmm. I wonder how many you need to get a full 3D picture. Can, or 360. Yeah, 360. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and a GoPro. I know they're working on something like that. It's like a ball. Yeah. Of, of uh, three six of. Uh, GoPros. Yeah. It's probably going to be expensive, but yeah. Well, pretty awesome. We'll put, we'll put in a, a request. <laughs> Equipment request. Well, that's Howard. Hey, Howard, I know you listen to this show. So, <laughs> um, okay. So, what helps you go through the teaching day of all the stresses happening in your job in particular? What helps you go through the day? You know, <clears throat> surprisingly, I... Um, I find that the day goes pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're lucky in that our day looks different every day. Every day looks different. And um, I might spend a couple of hours helping someone with a blog or helping a student with a project or struggling with our 3D printer, but it's always different. So if I spend all day today trying to get the fifth grade arthropods to print out properly, I know that tomorrow there'll be something new. That's right. that's that's helpful for me. It's not a grind. Right. It's not a grind like yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I agree with you there. It's definitely dynamic down here. That's why I like being here, and it's just the mentality of just being ready for anything. Basically, yeah. It's right? not. It's not predictable. So you have to kind of think on your feet and uh, be qu- nimble. I think nimble. nimble. Nimbleness is very good. Okay. So, what's what do you want to learn now, since you're, you're exposed to a lot of uh, these educational um, um, initiatives going on right now, um, design thinking to robotics, coding? What are you, what's one thing that you are, um, what, what, what's one thing you want to learn more about and why? I really want to learn more about robotics, mm-hmm. specifically coding and how that interfaces with robotics. I love the idea that you put something together and your code actually exists in the real life. In real life, right. In the, in the real world and you can make things move and happen and react. Right. Um, and that seems like a bit of a mystery to me. Right. I don't let the students know that, but it, it really does seem like... <laughs> we fake it until yeah. we actually make it. Exactly. Work, right. Um, yeah. I would love to learn more about that. And you can, you can create... Um, Robots that do just about anything and just the amount of impact you could make right. with that skill. So what would you say that would be the most exciting thing right now at your, or the thing that you are most excited about now or is there something else? That's one of the things I'm most excited about because I think it's accessible. I think it's, it's a realistic thing to achieve and it's something right. that our students could actually participate in and, and do and learn and um, master. And a lot of different options now. Exactly. Right? You exactly. don't have to buy the $350 Lego Robotics. Exactly. Anymore. Right. Huh, okay. So give me a tip. Uh, share with us a tip of how you inspire other teachers or even students in small ways. How do you inspire them? To keep them going. Um, I don't know that I inspire anyone or keep anybody <laughs> going. But I will say yes, that you do. my dad was a, is a teacher. Uh-huh. He's retired now. He was a teacher, public high school teacher. Um, and I remember when I first started teaching, he said, you know, I'll tell you the secret. There's a secret. You just need one trick. What's that trick? That's any just trick. One trick. <laughs> like one magic trick. One something that can get people's attention. And it's kind of silly, Mm-hmm. But at the same time, when I, th- when I reflect on that, what, what he was really saying is all you need to do is connect right. once and you've got them, the class, right. the students. The same thing applies to faculty. If you can 
show them something that is meaningful to them, you have them. Right. Then you can push a little and, and, and change things. This reminds me of City Slickers. With Curly, that's uh, Jack Palance. Remember that? I don't remember. When I, I Bi- saw it a long Bi- time ago. Billy Crystal asked um, um, Jack Palance, "What is that one thing, or how do you? What's the meaning of life?" And Jack Palance would hold up his uh, pointer finger and said, "It's one thing." And Billy Crystal was like, "What's the one thing?" And the, throughout the movie, he would say, "What's the one thing? What's the one thing?" And Jack Palance's character passed away, and Billy Crystal had to figure out what that one thing was for him. And, and the, what you just said, it's, it's, it's different for everyone. Yeah. But you find something for yourself, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think part of uh, what I see as my job is to find that one thing for all of our students and all of our faculty. Mm-hmm. To find that one thing that is going to get them, to make them brave, and to get them ready to take some risks and ready to make some changes. And you and I have both been here a long time. We know the faculty. We know a lot of the teachers pretty well. And I think that's really one of the most important things we do is find that thing. Right. And we know them really well and find that thing that they would, um, they, they would um, resonate with. Right? Okay. Name a time-saving tip that you do that you can give the teachers. What's a time-saving tip, if you have one? I, I do have one, and I'm actually pretty passionate about it. It's um, I keep my desktop organized. I stay on top of my email, and I stay on top of my desktop. Your, your computer desktop, silly. right? Yes, it seems silly, but I've seen some desktops that would stop your heart. <laughs> They're so awful. Right. I've seen that too. And I... these are the same people who come to me and with tears in their eyes that they can't find what they downloaded. Right. And they can't find anything else. They can't find their lesson plans, their report card template. Right. And that's so how do, you, how, do you, how do you keep it organized? You have to do it. But if you do it every day, it takes just five minutes. Now, do you use tags and all that? And how, I know we I just use, use Mac OS. I just use folders. Okay. And um, I, one of the things that I do a lot is I use my Google Drive. Mm-hmm. And so I put things that I want to keep up on my drive. My drive might be a little messy. Right. But at least the things that I'm working on presently are on my computer. If it's on my desktop, it's because it's important for me now or in the next couple of weeks. And then once I finish with the project, I put those things away. Right. No, it's a very good tip, and I, I have to uh, have, have to fix my desktop too again. It gets messy because they just accumulate all these screenshots and all this stuff that just accumulate on my desktop, and things do get lost. Um, okay, so what's the best advice you've ever received? Besides, there's one trick. You yeah, just need one, one trick. trick. Yes. I mean, you could expand on that if you need to, but what's the best advice? And and going along with that the best advice that you received that others can take also with them, the listeners of the show? I think the best advice that I've received is actually from students. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes they think they're giving advice, and usually that advice is not good. Mm -hmm. But we're fortunate to be in a school where we have some of the same students around from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. And... We see those students throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And what they've taught me is that the things they remember about your class and about your presence as a teacher are often not the things you imagine that they remember. And they remember um, stories you've told. They remember personal things that you've told them. And I think from them, again, I think that reinforced that idea of teaching as a relational practice. Right. And really reinforced that, the significance of that Mm -hmm. piece of it. Yeah, that's true. Um, Yeah. They they don't remember what you taught them. They don't. They don't. They don't remember it an hour later. They're panicking, and they. We just talked about this. No, nope, right. I, I don't remember. 
<laughs> or it's embarrassing when the teacher, uh, when the parent picks them up. Oh, so what did you learn today? They ask the student, and right there in front of them, and the kids are like, I don't know. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. But they'll remember a story I told about my brother's messy handwriting, or right. you know, yeah, um, like AJ, my son. AJ's in kindergarten, and he talks about Miss O's dog. That's all he talks about. Miss Dog's exactly. Dog. Miss Miss O's dog had a, had a cold or something like that, or was wearing a sweater, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> like okay, but uh, yeah, that's that's a very that's very important to remember. It's the relationship uh, between the student and the teacher. So, any last words, Krista? Um, any parting advice to teachers out there? Um, you want to give them uh, a little inspirational thing or? I don't, I, I don't, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. Close us I out. Think, <laughs> I think my only, my, my only advice for teachers would be to take some chances, shake things up, do things differently, experiment, see how your students respond. Um, I substituted for fourth grade for several weeks and they wrote the entire schedule for the day up on the board every day. And I was just getting so <laughs> bored with it. So one day I wrote the schedule for the day, but I left out all the vowels. <laughs> and that became a thing that the, the girls were just totally excited about. Wow. It was th- the smallest, dumbest wow. cool. innovation. Right. But... Every day we talked about it. They talked about it the next day. They wanted to know what it was going to be. They were so engaged. Wow. They were engaged. Now, it would have been nice if it would have been some earth-shattering lesson that I was teaching them. <laughs> but the point is that you can get that engagement by just switching one little thing because they notice everything. Right. And to take advantage of that and really play with it a little bit and see, see what happens. Very good. Very good. Very cool. All right. All right. So thank you, Krista. Uh, that's the end of our interview. And thank you for joining our show. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, a, I'm an avid listener. All right. Very cool. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, thank you for listening to the Teaching Bites podcast at www.teachingbites.com.